Bobby Chu, and today is portfolio reviews. This is going to be really fun. And I have these wonderful international guests here. Holy smokes. I want to, I want to welcome and thank Hermania from Ohio, Lola from South Africa, and Paulo from Brazil. And we're still Hello. waiting on a couple others, Hedda and Anna. I don't know if you are out there, but you did get a... Uh, invite in your emails and if you miss out that's totally fine because you could watch this later okay so the cool thing about doing these streams is that I will make sure that everything I talk about here is going to be um, applicable for everybody okay for everybody so here are some pieces that I took out all sorts of different styles, all sorts of different levels, all sorts of different everything. Uh, and thank you to our lovely uh, participants for being courageous and handing in their stuff. And this is all about learning. And so hopefully we could all learn together. So Hervania, since you were first onto the stream, I would love to go over yours first. Okay. Now, one of the things I really loved about this image was that it reminded me of my goddaughter because she would always wear her hair like this as well. Um, and so wonderful. One of the hardest things is the idea. And when I look at your idea, I think, ah, I feel connected. It's great. I do feel like there's quite a bit of line work in the face. And that can get kind of distracting. So I want to open up a lot of spaces, a lot of bigger spaces in the um, draw over here. Okay. So I'm going to go just like this. And of course, uh, there's no right or wrong answer, everybody. This is art. There's no real rules here. Right. But you can see, like, I'm trying to open up a bit more space in the cheek area, a little bit more area on the forehead, you know, kids with big foreheads, I don't know, I always find them really cute when they have big foreheads, right? So I want to give her a bigger forehead. The other thing I did was, depending if this is uh, for television or animated, or like, like um, sorry, depending if it's a final 2D design, that's the idea to make a two-dimensional show, or a computer animated show since things tend to go very computer animated right now i wanted to um just kind of go with that that's yeah that's what i was kind of feeling um big part of that is the textural lines for the hair right just a little bit of waviness will help yeah. to get that feeling across i also um, you can see I eliminated a bunch of lines from the nose, which is to help it just be a little bit more clear, a little bit more clean. Uh, if you've ever drawn a beautiful, uh, you know, typical model, you don't usually put a lot of lines on her face unless it's like drawn on her face. And that's what you want to do. You want to copy those drawings on her face. So you can kind of see the effect of um, the cleanliness, like opening up spaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's, that's what we're looking for now. And of course, kids, big eyes. So kept the big eyes that you had, but made it more, made the pupils bigger. Okay. Right. Like when you look at, you think about baby, anything, generally you see like, less of the whites of the eyes. I, I don't know. That's, that's my own kind of like, um, when I think about kids, that's what I kind of remember. The other part to this is that I made your arms a bit shorter because if we put our arms to our sides, they will generally kind of end up at our hips. And so uh, this is like, I just felt like she could scratch her knee right now and she's almost standing up straight. So I wanted to <laughs> just slim that down a bit, you know? Okay. Um, and then a little tip for everybody is just, I worked on the general um, 
shape of the body first because the clothes, if the clothes are super puffy, then I might not even bother with a body. But since the clothes do uh, reflect the body shape, I felt it to be important to put in that body. And here's something for everybody. Um, one side is more of a straighter line. This other side is much more of curved lines, right? And when I'm drawing this, I'm not thinking anatomy necessarily. I'm thinking tension. I'm thinking uh, forces. So as, as we start to bend, those lines will get straighter. And as we start to squish on the other side, they'll get curvier. Now that's super simple, easy to understand for this example, but I'll show you one other example. For a lot of us, when we're drawing a person bent over, right? If you ever tried to draw this pose, a lot of times this line will look like crap and it'll just soften everything up and it doesn't look good. Well, that's because this is a curved line. And by nature, this curved line, unless you put it in exactly or more or less exactly, it will f start to lose a lot of its strength. And it's losing a lot of its strength because it is a curved line. What happens to the skin as we bend over, right? It starts to pull. Just like if we went the other way and we start to lean backwards, right? The skin on the front will start to pull. And when things pull, when you pull, let's get super simplified. When you pull a string, when you pull a line, what happens? It becomes straight. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the areas uh, not as in terms of like structure, but in terms of force. Let me actually keep, uh, I'll just move these guys over a little bit and I'll, I'll redraw this one because that one totally does not feel like, um, that kind of a pose. Instead, if we're thinking about things in forces, and this is a great exercise, it doesn't have to be how you draw, but if you're thinking about things in forces, you're thinking, okay, the neck, yeah, that's gonna be normal. And then we get to the back, that's gonna be quite straight. And so this line is representing the rib cage. This line is representing the space in between the rib cage and the pelvis. This line is representing the pelvis, okay? And then we have the gap in between, and then we have a shoulder. The shoulder's gonna come out. Did you hear me? Yeah. And then a lot of like curve lines inside, right? Mm -hmm. The leg here is also bent. So where would the stretching be? It would be on the outside of the leg. If you think about just putting a string along the outside of your leg and then you bend the leg, then all of a sudden it gets taunt. Uh, then what happens on the inside of the leg? The inside of the leg is squished, right? Um, now these are the lines of tension, the lines of squishing. Uh, some observations here. Straight lines on one side, curved lines on the other, right? And that tends to be like that for the whole entire figure generally. Straighter lines, um, well in this case it's stylized a bit, but if I was gonna you know, put some form in there, then it'd be curvier lines on the outside, straighter lines on the inside, right? Creating that feeling of like skin moving around, forms moving around. And so after I've done this, of course that still doesn't look too hot. And what we need to do here is this was all based on force. 
This part's awesome. Now we're just going to put in the anatomy according to the force. So here's a rib cage, but I'm going to stretch it a bit on the outside. Yeah, just kind of feeling it out. And then here's my obliques, the side muscles, and I'm just going to stretch those out a bit as well. My gluteus maximus, my gluteus minimus, I'm giving those some curves too, but not nearly as curved as if it was bending the other way. Then I would have like these kind of curves, right? And be way more curved. These are still somewhat very linear. Um, and then after that, we add in the anatomy on this side, and you can see that it has that nice strength to it. This curve all of a sudden has this nice strength to it. When before, you know, this curve didn't, right? Because this curve is just a curve. The other curve is based off of straight lines of tension that correspond, that work with the anatomy. Does that make sense? It does. Awesome. So let's get into your paint over now. So first thing I did was, um, well, this is a rough line art, OK? And so I took this line art, and there's no um, clothes on it or anything just yet. So I redid the line art. And how did I redo this line art? That's going to be nice and simple, too. You just reduce the opacity. Or old school, put another piece of paper over top of your original paper and trace it over. Uh, but yeah, with this one, I added in the clothes. Now some subtleties here. You notice how the line, uh, the line curved here, there's a bend here. So then I also want to put in, you know, a uh, fold in her overalls to reflect that. Okay, I also saw that um, there's some space in between the overalls and the shoulders. And since the shoulders are kind of holding up those overalls, I put them really flush, very, very close. This one is kind of just hanging off the shoulder. And of course, if anybody in our um, little panel here has any questions, just let us, just let me know. Uh, this is, I found this is very important because this is subtleties. Just like how the little heart is a beautiful little subtlety that I really love and, and um, appreciate. These lines on the shirt, this little band-aid on her leg, wonderful. The band-aid I made bigger because it was such a nice, cute little touch. I didn't want anybody to miss it. Okay, okay. and then the teeth, uh, just a nice big gap there. You know, one of the big ones right in the front. Uh, let that go missing. That would be fun. Now, line weight. Let me just talk about that a little bit. This isn't very cleaned up. I'm not in like cleanup mode, but I did want to express the idea of using various line weight. So for example, these cheeks here is a subtle detail. And with a thicker line weight, I feel like there's too much attention there. And we could take away a lot of that attention just by thinning out the lines. Okay. The eyelashes, those can be I'm just going to put Lola's mic on mute for a sec. <laughs> I'll, I'll put you uh, on mute. Just make sure you're not moving around because the mic picks it up. OK, so um, the next thing here is the hands. I just felt like put your hands in those positions and see how it feels. See if it's natural to you. We're not trying to copy poses, but we are trying to get the kind of essence of a pose or the, the feeling, right? And see if it feels kind of awkward. Um, and then the other thing is I made a little subtlety here where you can see 
how the foot looks like from the front and from the side a little bit. That is a nice thing for everybody down the line if you're a character designer, because then all of a sudden with one pose, they can see two different uh, views of the feet. I like all right. that. Uh, awesome. Next thing I did was I just colored it, OK? Just some simple colors. And actually, I, I dropped your colors. I forgot hair bands, I just realized. So imagine there's hair bands on there. Now, this is something else I just wanted to kind of show you. This is uh, two-toning the character, OK? What this is is an adjustment layer. And for those that might not know what an adjustment layer is, that's this little circle that's cut in half down here. It's, it has a lot of these options here that are very, 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 very similar to adjustments over here. But if you go up here, what you're doing is you're adjusting everything on this layer that you've selected, whatever layer you've selected. Um, Okay, and then, and then say we make an adjustment layer, the difference is going to be that it will change everything below it, not just the layer that you're selected. You see, it becomes its own layer. And so if I make everything darker, oh, that's just because I'm in a folder. I'm going to confuse people now. The folder has a layer mask, and I'll explain as I show you this one. OK, so if I make everything darker, the whole entire thing gets darker. If I want things more saturated, everything gets more saturated. I can change hues. I can colorize. Right, This one kind of becomes important because I'm looking for what does the character look like in the dark? That's what I'm kind of looking at here. Now, everything is super monochromatic. But if I just tone down my opacity a bit, now all of a sudden I have a nighttime version of Hervania's character, mm. right? And so that's going to come in handy. I'm going to make it even darker. Now, how does this work? Well, we have our layer, our adjustment, and we have our layer mask. What a layer mask is, is like imagine everything white that's in this. Okay, first, the proportions of the square are the same proportions as my document. Whatever is white in my layer mask, I can see the effects of this layer mask in those areas. If I paint in a black area into our layer mask, it's like cutting a hole in that piece of paper, and now I can see the original. Right? That part doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then all I need to do is make sure my whole layer mask is black. Just paint bucket. Okay, and then I can paint in white wherever I want the shadows to appear because I'm showing um, a darker version. Right, and that's what I did here. Just softer less obtrusive, but then I did the two-tone there. Okay, and then after that, I made a color layer. So a color layer is just adding a bit of warmth to those cheeks and to the ears and to the nose. Color layer is, is a color layer because I set it from normal, I changed it to color. And that means the only things on this layer that will affect everything in this document are um, whatever the hue and the amount of saturation is in this layer. So in other words, if I'm using, say, this, I go much darker, you actually don't see much of a difference, right? Like, it doesn't get darker. And if I go lighter, well, it gets... Here, let me give you a better example. <laughs> because, okay, when you get darker, you don't see as much of that saturation when it's like super saturated. That's why they look so different. But say I go like this, okay, 
and I go lighter. You know, that lightness doesn't transfer. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. Okay, so that's color. And last thing, it's just some highlights. Same highlights as yours. And there you go. So if we look at kind of bef oh, wah, wah, wah. let me see here. Let's put this in here. All right. Oh. Let's put this up here. Right, so if we look at before and after, well, you can see a side by side. What am I doing? All right, so there you go. Great job, great job. Uh, awesome. Like I said, the hardest thing is really the ideas and that's an adorable character. So you just gotta work Thank on you. your uh, technical skills a little bit more. Um, if you do have a schoolism class, I would suggest one of the character designers on there Daniel Ariega comes to mind. He was the head of characters, art director on characters for Coco. Um, yeah, and then this one. Next is Lola. Hey, Lola. Yeah. Hey. Great job here. I liked all your environments. I picked this one um, simply because there, there was just more to work with here. One thing that I thought with your uh, portfolio was that you want it, or the four images that you sent over, is that part of doing layouts, doing environments, things like that, is really you're an idea maker as well, not just a technician to like get everything accurately portrayed and things like that. We want to be like idea makers and. Sometimes that also means that we are excuse makers. And what I mean by that is right now it's very dark for me. So I'm trying to make an excuse of why areas could be lighter. Okay, so I'm looking at this and I'm going, hmm. Um, first, I did this. Now, why am I doing that? It's because you have bright tones here. And these bright tones on the wall are taking away power from those bright yellow tones. Right? And when we take away a lot of the contrast, right, those tones will be more emphasized. And we're not done with them yet. This is only like the first kind of part. Okay. The second part to this is that you can see I've cleared up some of that green there just so you can see the silhouette of um, the fence more. I thought that was kind of important. And okay. a lot of the trees, they kind of blended together, you know? So again, we're excuse makers. So my excuse here is perhaps there's windows on the side of the house you know, that we can't see and they're shining onto these pointy trees. Um, I made it slightly brighter over here just to kind of suggest that, but now that I'm looking at it, I would probably just want to tone down some of these other brushes or these other trees as well, just so it's not too distracting. You know, and then it feels a bit more like, yeah, that light. I'm seeing those trees because of that uh, light that I can't see from the side of the house. The other thing I want to mention here is like when we're looking at this, I just found these rooms to be too dark. You know what I mean, Lola? Because like these rooms are so bright, some light should probably leak in there. Does that make sense? Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and then I love the fact yeah. that you, yeah, go ahead. Were you saying something? I think Lola might've froze a bit, but um, 
I really love how she put in these bits of light on the ground here coming from the window. Oh, there you are. You're back. All right. Awesome. Um, so I love these little parts here, but the shapes of them makes makes it like the, the ground is completely flat. There's no texture anymore. There's no grass. You know what I mean? Okay. So either way, Lola, don't you worry. We got you covered. This is recorded. Um, so what we want to do here is we want to first, with any kind of paint over, if you feel like you're painting, uh, you went quite far, but you need to change it, you want to change it, the best thing to do is really start to take away some of that contrast in the areas that you want to change especially. Then you mess with it again. Because if you can imagine you already finished something, and this goes for anybody, um, you already finished something, there's already going to be quite a bit of contrast. When you add something to it, you're not really going to notice it as much because contrast attracts the eye. And since there's already a lot of contrast, me putting a couple more marks down here, you won't really notice it unless I take away that contrast, right? I bring all the values much closer together so I can rework everything. Okay, next step here, the sky. Super simple one. I changed the sky to a greener sky because I was like, this is, this is a creepy scene. And we're always trying to think about the emotional impact that our stuff is going to have. Nathan Fawkes said to me one time, he was like, um, oh, you're saying a lot of the attendees are having trouble uh, accessing this zoom webinar um well you know what for everybody that can't make it to the zoom webinar youtube same thing okay and i'll go to some of the questions in youtube as well in a bit um but yeah so with all of our stuff it's all about emotion movies if a movie looks beautiful and we don't feel anything it's a crappy movie and it's like a big waste of money. And we're just like, ah, shoot. Um, books, paintings, everything. So Lola, the quickest way to bump up your stuff, to take it to the next level, is to start off by thinking, what is the emotional impact that I want my audience to have and gear everything towards that? Because that's the end goal. It's not to paint a pretty house. It's not to, or a creepy house. <laughs> uh, it's all about, you know, that emotional impact. So after this, a glowing windows will not really look glowing until you have a little bit of a light bloom go past the window. Just a little. Okay, and then finally, I told you, I like those lights that you put in there, Lola. It was a really nice excuse to make, you know, this eerie kind of like weird lights are coming out of this house. The house looks really creepy. And so those are my suggestions to you. Okay, thank you very much. You're very welcome. I would have loved to keep going on this. Things I would have added to this. The creepy tree, I would have loved to bring that back. And I would love to think how can I make up an excuse to bring back this creepy tree? It's either the creepy tree is a pale, creepy tree, so we can see it a bit better because it has a pale uh, base color. It could be perhaps there's something in between the creepy tree and the mountain in the back that okay. picks up some light, so then you could also see the silhouette of the creepy tree again. Uh, the fence, perhaps some broken fence uh things there um the grass to make it just way more messy since this does look like an abandoned house like what happens to the lawn when you don't cut it let's get real into that i would also think that there would be a lot of crap on the lawn like stuff on the lawn uh leaves 
especially with all the trees around. And that can make a beautiful excuse to put in different um, colors as well, because you can think of it as maybe it's fall. You know, you can change the colors all of a sudden because of that, things like that. Um, clouds would have been nice too, I think, and a, and a partially covered moon. That, that would be nice too. But, you know, those are just my suggestions. So, great job. Very much. Awesome. Did you have any questions? Did No? Um, no, no, not, not towards this particular piece. Um, I have other questions, but they can go later. Okay, cool. Um, well, yeah, let me know your other question. I go over that as well. Did you want to ask me that like, now or later? Um, right now? Sure. Um, okay, I guess, yeah, for background design, could be like, so how to make your background design portfolio like stand out? Think of it as this is, this is not the background anymore. This is a secondary character for the film. What's the okay. story behind this character? You know, it was once beautiful and now it's run down. And now there's like alien kind of life forms coming out of it, like through a different dimension, you know, as you start to get into it. And then you start thinking about all the details because Lola, you, you have great stuff. You're missing details, I feel, that will bring everything even further into like this character. Uh, building those emotions. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, um, I think Lola's just having a little difficulty with her connection here. So I'm going to go on to Paulo. Okay. Hey, um, Paulo. Hey. Beautiful job. <laughs> Thank you. And so um, you're a working professional? Yes. I work as a background designer for a very local studio here and, and I like I make concept backgrounds and also when I have to I make final final versions for movies and uh, animated series wonderful wonderful everything two-dimensional we don't work with 3d oh okay okay well this is really great um, you had a lot of really beautiful pieces uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, so it's it's a little tough to decide, but I like this fat, chubby like um, critter, creature, because you know I just like <laughs> chubby creatures. We have that in common. We both like creatures yeah. a lot. Here's the first thing I did, Paulo. Yeah. You see how much you notice those parts, mm. and there's yes. no reason for it, right? So I toned it down. Next thing, super simple. Tone it down some more to frame the important part. Yes. Right? If we look at, and this is like for everybody, if we just kind of relax our eyes a bit, maybe squint a little bit, you know, you your eyes will go down into this bottom area more. So with all of our images, it doesn't matter if it's this one or, you know, people out there listening and drawing something right now, relax your eyes. Where do the eyes go? How much do they go there? Where else do they go? How much do they go there? How much do we want them to be there? What order do we want people to look at things? Currently, I stare straight at those eyes. That's guaranteed right? And I have a little bit of a problem even taking my eyes off of those eyes. Oh, that's very nice. I put a lot of work into yeah, the eyes. Yeah, because they're great. They are really yeah. well thought out, very kind of uncomfortable for me too, because there's like this line, <laughs> this string, yes, yes, right? And it's like, oh, what I was man. trying to do. Thank you. <laughs> right on the guy's eyeball. So that sucks. <laughs> I was um, trying to make him very uncomfortable to look at. Yeah, but then it also adds to the overall feeling that um, you want the viewer to have, 
right? Which is like a fun kind of feeling, yeah. funny kind of feeling, perhaps. <laughs> These guys are rough. I'm not going to pick on them. I know they're rough. Okay, so here's what I did. And I'll do a little bit more. But what am I doing here? Okay. You see the values here, especially after, and I, you know, I made this stuff darker. Yeah. So once I make this stuff darker, once you put in a darker tone, then that means in this universe, which is your painting, a darker tone, that dark exists every time you put in a new darker tone. So then you have to ask yourself, where else would this dark tone exist? Would it exist anywhere else? So for example, you see, you have a dark tone, which is in the mouth, especially right here. So now that you put that tone in there, that means that it exists in this universe. Would it exist anywhere here? Anything that dark? Probably. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, then I start to look into everything else. Where else would those dark tones go? Right, and as I started to do those dark tones, I was like, you know, um, the arm here, and actually I would, if I was, if I had more time, I'd work this arm a little bit more and make it more of the sense of like, light is on the left side and this is kind of like a ball kind of like a flattened ball a little bit with no air right at the bottom of it's kind of gone so that means that i'm doing things to um accentuate that idea of this thing being very spherical even though it is abstract so how did i do that well first if you look at this eye i toned down the lighter areas of that eye as well as this arm right so everything along yeah. this area I just toned it down a bit. I also opened up your eye a little bit because I felt like those folds there got a little weird for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put in a little influence of that blue since it is very blue, that mask. Yeah. So then I just want to put in a little bit of that. A um, uh, little highlight on the lips there. And you notice I darkened some things here to create more mm -hmm. of a spherical feeling. I did the opposite for the other side. You see that? All those areas get lighter, right? When I was looking at it, I was like, wow, a lot of these dark tones, they push towards this left side quite a lot. Now, the, the kind of lesson that we can all kind of take away from this for everybody is um, a lot of the very complex things that you see painted, the idea that was in the artist's head was a lot more simplified, I feel, generally. For me, this, I'm thinking of it as a ball right with with um kind of like accents of arms and m weird mouths and whatever <laughs> else but generally i'm thinking of it uh, as a ball so i'm looking for lighter tones right right in here mm -hmm. and i'm looking for darker tones on the opposite side that's how I'm thinking about it as a ball. And I'm describing those lighter tones and those darker tones with um, accents, with paint that describes the details of this kind of sort of ball. Okay, and then there is a lot of complexity here because it is a very complex um, painting. The other thing I wanted to talk about here is I added in quite a bit of saturation towards that right, or that left side. Yes. And that is just, as you probably know, that's subsurface scattering. So mm -hmm. as the light comes in through the skin, a lot of it will bounce off of the skin because it's a form. But since it is semi-translucent, perhaps, that's what I was thinking. Anyways, mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking you were doing. Um, 
some of those photons, those light photons, will penetrate through the skin. They will, um, let's get real nerdy here. <laughs> And uh, by the way, for anybody interested in this kind of thing, Sam Nielsen is w how I learned this. Fundamentals of light and color. It's awesome. So a lot of these photons, they'll come down, they'll hit the surface, and then they'll bounce off. Right? Yes. And there'll be a bunch of them. And then we have a bunch of these photons that are going to come in and they're going to get through the skin. Right, so they're going to come in, they're going to penetrate through the skin, but as they start to penetrate through the skin, they're bouncing all around because it's somewhat of a solid inside and it's going to bounce all around. It's going to light things up as it's bouncing around. It's going to lose energy as it's bouncing around. So as it gets deeper, the energy starts to fade. Okay, so everything's bouncing around. I get that. I understand that. There's a lot more action happening on the surface of the skin. And as we get deeper, all that light starts to fade. Why does it get more saturated? Paulo, any guesses? Lola, That's the only part that I don't know. Okay. I just... I just know that it gets more saturated. No problem. <laughs> Up to here, I know what you're talking about. You got me. <laughs> no problem. So there's a couple of different factors here. Uh, what is inside the skin? Right? Uh, if you imagine like a plastic bag, you can't see inside the plastic bag because of the lighting, but then there's a red ball inside. Right? Then you put it up against the light and you can start to see through it now. Will you see any of that red? Most likely, yeah. The other part to this is um, how we're observing the light. Because say the exposure in this image, and you do have a lot of exposure here. Yeah. Look at how bright these things get. Right? This is what I would say, you know, it's a, it's a design thing. But of course, without all of this, if it was just this area, that would be overexposed. And when things are overexposed, they go towards white. And when things go towards white, they get less saturated. And now we're coming back down here and going, okay, so why is this getting more saturated? Well, because of the stuff inside and because comparatively, this area that's getting hit by the light it's getting more and more exposure, oh, right? And the exposure of the image is highly exposed. So that will start to get less and less saturated. So comparatively, it will get more saturated as we get into darkness. Cool, right? Very, very cool. All right. Um, and of course, Hervania, uh, Lola, if you guys have any questions, let me know as well. Okay. This one, um, unfortunately, Hedda is not here. So I love this one. It's very nice. The style of it is very nice as well. But I did feel like the face, the head, was a different style than the body. Especially when we look further away. You know, if we cover up that face and we just look at the body, that's looking like really um, well formed and everything. The face is nice too, but definitely feels more 2D, more illustrative. So what I did there was I just worked on the face. Okay, so the line that Hedo was using I felt like it was kind of unnecessary to have it go straight up to the top there. Uh, beauty is in its subtleties. Coolness is all about like contrast and streamlined lines and things like that. Uh, when you think of a vase, it's about these subtleties in its curvature and things like that. 
So I also wanted to tone down a lot of the eye area as well because that eye area feels very illustrative. It gets very, very, very dark under her eyes. Um, so I cleaned off her makeup as well because I just wanted to clean it off and then reapply it. Okay, I'm starting to reapply it here. And from here, what am I doing? Taking away a bunch of that contrast again because this is another thing that's very common for so many painters out there. So think about your own paintings as I'm talking about this. A lot of times uh, painters, many times painters will use the right tones, but the wrong amount. And they use too much of the extremes. The dark extreme, the light extremes. When, And this is very general. So there's definitely exceptions, but when um, sometimes it's like it, all you needed was the tiny, tiny little spot of that tone and then everything else gets lighter, right? And this is a very um, easy example of that. These tones here in the face, they get just too light comparatively to everything else in the image. So then when I tone it down, it feels more natural. But then those still those extremes are still there. Right? The lightest tone here is still the same light tone that we began with, and the darkest tone on this face is still the darkest tone. It's just less. And that's something for everybody to kind of be cognizant of and just be like aware of, okay? because look at the difference. You see, this feels way more contrasting, right? This feels much less contrasting and just more like solid together. Uh, of course, if this person, and I'm like, you can paint however you want. And if this person, if Hedda, if you did the whole entire painting in this style of the face, then I wouldn't even say anything, but the way I look at art is I look at the whole entire piece of art and I go, what was the artist's objective? And the artist's objective for me from looking at this is something much more three-dimensional. Okay, so boom, some hair. Let's take a closer look on what happened there with that hair. Right, just add, adding in a bit of noise before I bring it back out. If I just drew these lighter pieces of hair on, it makes a bit of a difference, right? But adding in the stuff underneath, you can see it comes through. And then a little bit of highlights. And this is just um, adding just a bit more tone on there, just toning it down just slightly before, after. This one, like holy smokes, you know, the, it's lovely. It's very, the tones and everything, the mood. The mood is weird. <laughs> I got to tell you, uh, Anna, wherever you are, the, the mood is weird. Parts of it feel like it's intended to be funny. And parts of it feel like it's intended to be like, kind of like awe inspiring, like, wow, it's kind of ghostly or something. I don't know. Um, so here's some questions. First question was, uh, where is that light coming from that's lighting up? underneath her face right F this is going back to uh lola's example here part of the whole thing is us making excuses of why to light things the way that we want so it's totally fine to have this lighting but let's make a reason for that light maybe she's holding something maybe that's what it was maybe she's holding a sacred glowing gold bunny that's like alive and it's like, you know, her 
friend, her source of power. I don't know. That could be cool, you know, because it's also adding to your overall feeling of the ears, which is like fun, funny. Then there's the structure. And so a lot of the stuff is rendered very nicely. So sometimes the structure can be harder to see what's going on. So I just want to do a little redraw for you. Okay, and if you look at those arms, the shoulders especially, you see how your shoulder has kind of caved in a bit? Right, and when you look at, um, and I thickened up the base of the ears too, you know, so it's like, how do those ears actually come out of the head? I still wasn't totally sure. The other thing that, um, that I noticed is like, if you follow the hips, it gets pretty strange. Right, and the belly button starts to slide towards the left quite a bit. Uh, so just, yeah, those were the things I wanted to kind of bring up. So where, what can we learn from all this? It's really, everything is everything, isn't it? Like with this one, it's really about drawing the stuff underneath first or even more. Right, drawing like drawing the structure first, and getting that all worked out before you put on clothes and all the other stuff. I think that's what Anna here needed, and just to uh, you know, like um, like Lola's, think about the emotional impact you want to have, and let that be the guiding thing for everything else. All right, so now I would love to do a, just a quick Q&A, uh, answer some questions, any kind of art questions, things like that. And I got my Photoshop open here. I could help you guys out as well. I'll, I'll be looking at uh, YouTube as well. Um, yeah, so if you guys want to know anything, hopefully I could help. Uh, chat I'm people. I'm very bad with questions. Oh my god, me. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. No <laughs> problem. Um, I'm sure there will be a bunch of questions of like how to paint things or whatever in in um, in the chat there. This is a little something I was just working on this morning. Very pretty, yeah. Oh, it's thanks. Very pretty. <laughs> I love this style that you do of the winged creatures that don't have wings, like this <laughs> little guy that looks like a hippopotamus. Oh, thanks. I think it's very lovely. This is going to be fun. This is for my, I'm doing like, um, my digital painting class on schoolism is so old now. So. I have to, to, to buy schoolism. I finally have some time in, to spare, and I think I will sign it. Right on. Yeah, totally. Uh, is, is it today? Let, let's plug schoolism here for a bit. Is it today that the... The, the sale the, ends? The spring. Yeah, um, today is the last day of the sale. Ends, yeah. So the sale is so everybody go in. <laughs> Thanks, Paulo. Uh, yeah, the sale is uh, usually it's three hundred dollars. <laughs> three hundred dollars for a year of education. The sale makes it two hundred dollars, or one hundred ninety-eight dollars. So uh, today is the last day of the sale. You get access to everything in the um, schoolism on the site like all the content. So yeah, totally recommend that. And I'm gonna just go to some questions. Rodrigo, 
How do you manage brushwork edges on painting? Okay. And then the, la the next person, what did you say Nathan Falk said? Nathan Falk said that um, he thinks about environments, sets as secondary characters for the film. So it itself has, it should have a character. Okay, so the question here is, above that is, uh, how do you manage brushwork edges on a painting? Awesome. Let me show you that. Because the way, okay, the way that I learned painting, digital painting, was literally by myself. Um, in the very beginning, it was literally by myself. There was no internet. Uh, there was... Adobe, Adobe Illustrator 1 just came out. So it kind of gives you an idea. Um, so I'm alone in Toronto, Canada, and there's not even a term called digital painting yet. And I don't know what I'm doing. So the way that I ended up using a brush or learned how to use a brush is very different than how other people use brushes generally, unless Unless they kind of learned it from me, I, you know, more often than not, or they learned it from somebody that learned it from me. Generally, how people use brushes is like this, where it's like very little shape dynamics, if any. So the brush size is not going to get larger or smaller. And there's transfer on here where pen pressure will control either the opacity or the flow or both. So you can control how see-through something is. Great. That's not how I do things. So how I do things, and actually I do use this as well because I use many different ways. Um, but the technique that I want to talk about specifically here with like controlling edges multi in very easily um, very quickly in many different ways, I use this. What is this? This is just a default brush. Whether smoothing is turned on, I don't care. I don't really notice that much with smoothing actually. Um, minimum diameter for my brush is set by pen pressure. That's it. Default, my spacing is at 25%. Okay, so actually these little stamps are not even that close together. They're at 25%. So that means if I go like this, you can see texture. You can see all those little circles, which some people might find annoying. I don't. I use it to my advantage because when I go like this, it becomes textural. And really, if you had to simplify all brushes, you could probably simplify it into smooth or textural. So then I use this kind of a thing for sketching any kind of texture, whether it's rocks, whether it's um, fur, trees, whatever. It doesn't matter uh, because I just use it as um, simplifying things down to is it a smooth s surface? Right? Is it a smooth surface? Or is it a textural surface? Okay. And I'm using shape dynamics. Now, this setting here, um, shape, shape dynamics and 25% spacing, that's not all we need. The other thing that some of you might have noticed is that I use very little flow with organic subjects. If it's a very, um, if it's a hard body surface, like a car, a spaceship, things like that, then I tend to use more of this kind of a brush, soft edged. Organic things, I tend to use this. Okay, so, um, and I tend to use it with very low flow. That's the key here. With very low flow, we're able to 
uh, we're able to go for a while before the, the paint gets to 100%, right? The other interesting thing about this is when I'm painting lighter, or when I'm painting with a lighter tone, I press hard, not a lighter tone, but a tone that's closer to the tone that I'm painting on top of, then I could create softer edges, right? And I'm using 100% opacity right now. If I just tone down my opacity a bit, I get flawless transitions. And I'm using a hard edge brush, everybody, right? It's not a soft edge brush, but you don't notice the hard edges. You don't notice the hard edges because the flow of the paint is coming out so slowly, I'm able to make it look like soft edges. And the thing about this is, without changing my brush, I press lighter, and I can make a hard edge without changing my brush, right? And I could go from a hard edge here to a soft edge. Look at it on the top. As it goes upwards, it turns into a soft edge. Hard edge, press softly. Soft edge, press hard. Nice thorough explanation of how I use my brushes for edges. Um, if your transition is not happening as smooth as you want it to be, it's because your color is too strong and your opacity is probably too strong. See, I can't get a soft edge as much here because the contrast that I'm using, it's too far, it's too big. If I take a tone that's closer to the paint that I'm painting on top of, you see now I could create more of a soft edge and then I start pressing lighter, create a nice hard edge. And of course you can up the intensity with opacity, right? And if you want, you turn up your flow too. You'll get a much sharper edge very, very quickly. That's a good one, isn't it? I don't know about you guys, yeah, but um, very good. <laughs> I'm very focused on what you're saying right now because it's very good. Fantastic. I have a question. Yeah. Um. So, like, instead of trying to come up with an art direction and like the process of that. Sorry, what was the question again? cut out a bit um like um how to come up with an art direction like what do you consider and what is the purpose of coming up with an art direction like a style is that what you mean yeah. by okay uh for me my method is really i i'm like a collector of knowledge Right, and, and the more knowledge I collect, the more options I'll have. And with more options, the more special the style will be because I'll have more options. If you only have like two or three options in your head for styles, then all of a sudden your styles become super limited. So for me, it's like very much like learn about two, you know, the 2D design, right? Learn about that. Learn about environments. Even if you don't want to do environments, I still make a point to learn about environments, you know, in different styles and so on and so forth. It, it's, that's my philosophies is like gather. Think about it this way, Lola. Um, how much of a style could you create for yourself if you only had three things in the closet? But if you had a whole bunch of, if you owned a whole bunch of different, you know, styles, clothes, you look into your closet and then you can mix and match and whatever you end up taking out of that closet, 
for your outfit, which is the painting, uh, it'll be very unique, and it'll be very unique to you, the one and only yeah. Lola in the world, you know, that did this, right? And that's how we want to create really great styles, I feel. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. You're very welcome. And I hope everybody uh, enjoyed the stream, got something out of it. Uh, that's the idea here. I wanted to mention something real quick here. A change is coming. Weekly streams, okay? Um, for everybody on YouTube, they could see this. But for you guys, I want you to know. Weekly streams, they used to be on Tuesdays and Fridays. I'm going to be changing them starting next week to Mondays and Thursdays. Okay, Mondays, um, same time as today, and Thursdays, same time as today. Okay. Yeah, thanks. cool. Yeah, and I, I want to do more of these. You know, it's, it's nice to teach actual artists out there where I could see them, talk with you and everything. Um, I miss that. You know, it's, it's been like 15 <laughs> years since I taught in college. But doing this, it really brings everything back. Very nice. I'm loving everything. Fantastic. Me too. Well, hope to see you guys there. And uh, yeah, let us know in the comments. Let me know in the comments if you want to see anything else. And otherwise, have a really great day. Thanks, Bobby.